So they are humans. They are beautiful, clever humans. Definitely appreciate when they are not being treated as a number. When when they they can feel when we care, and that's one of the reasons why we invited them here because we wanted them to be part of this conversation. We wanted them to be us. Those uh, industry leaders or those representatives of academia directly. So that, as uh, Dr. Mahotra said at the beginning, so that this discussion about them isn't without them in the first place. So another thing I've learned about students is the sort of the difference between theory and practice. So we've done a lot of research what should help you, students. Uh, but then when we try to meet with you, we are thinking, are you even interested to listen to what we have read about? Uh, we have, uh, your, uh, through our career development service that we provide through, through ATMC Group and SD Employability Life Program, we have uh, started focusing mainly on ensuring that the students are exposed to five strategic capabilities that include uh, um, understanding of careers, what are the new careers ahead of them, not just the jobs, but the sustainability of careers and what Mr. Dr. Tower mentioned here about um, understanding that they may start in one job and end up in something completely different. Maybe they do IT, but how are they working interdisciplinary? Do they maybe learn some sales skills, some marketing skills, more than just that one focus uh, area? Uh, and then we have also, um, we also want them to think about think concepts such as growth mindset. You know, maybe some... Hello, hello. <laughs> um, sometimes you think maybe I'm not smart enough, I'm not good enough, and we just want to tell you with the hard um, training, with, uh, with training, you can actually improve and um, move yourself forward. We also want uh, you to know that uh, how important is to network. So everybody that you have met here now uh, becomes part of your network and uh, you can connect with them, you can learn from them, they can become your mentors, that's in, uh, incredibly important. Uh, last but not least, maybe negotiation skills and also cultural intelligence. So what does it mean uh, working internationally? Uh, are there, what are you going to be facing going forward when you engage with different cultures in different countries? You will end up working in a different Maybe you will work in India, but your colleagues will be from different countries, so how do you deal with that? So, um, I will also, I would therefore like to use it and because so every time we try to engage students, we invite them for webinars, uh, especially during COVID, there was no other option than that. Um, and uh, we feel, okay, so we run this webinar, but they're most likely on social media during that, and they're not listening. So I wanted to ask them, what motivates you, what makes you engaged, uh, what, what would help you, uh, how would you help us to keep you engaged in this discussion going forward? Because that demand for these type of um, answers needs to come from you. Thank you, thank you Marketa. Um, while during the COVID years when I was teaching, and teaching, teaching over, um, over Zoom is hard, um, my son pointed out very gently that if it's hard for you to teach a one hour lecture, can you imagine how hard it is for us to sit for six to eight hours in front of the screen? Um, it was definitely, definitely harder. There was one person you didn't ask a question, did you? Who was it for? And good afternoon, everyone. I have a question for Vinay sir. Sir, as we see that, FinTech industry is <coughs> rapidly, almost it is among the top funded industry in India. Uh, we are moving towards the digital banking nowadays, almost all the banks are digital. Uh, we have seen the example of Paytm, PhonePay, etc. And after, after the pandemic, this has growing rapidly. In which are security is a big threat. So as a cyber security expert, how will you see this challenge? Uh, very interesting question. So, FinTech industry is evolving, as you are right. There are a lot of pieces that was being talked about, like of open banking, digital rail, okay. There are multi-rails which are there. We are talking about the contactless payment today. And there are many more which are still being worked on. Obviously, the use cases differ, and the security requirements and the aspects also differ. For example, I'll just relate one of the examples and, and I think that is going to help you in terms of understanding. So when you are doing a transaction 
using a POS machine. The entire system from where the data is getting, uh, the transaction is happening from the POS machine to the acquirers to the issuers. So I am not sure if in case you understand the term the acquirer and the issuer. Acquirers are the ones who have actually given their set of POS machines and issuers are the ones who have basically given the credit card or the debit card for that matter. So there is an entire chain, the ecosystem which works in the background. So for each of their aspect, when the transaction is happening over the network, there is a state of requirements which are there from PCI Council called as PCI DSS, which as an organization you need to comply. While you are inputting the PIN, which is your four digit or six digit or eight digit PIN which has been given to you by the card provider. While you are doing the transaction and inputting the PIN there, there is a host of requirement which is there sitting as a standard which is called as PCI PIN for that matter. And the application which is sitting on those POS machines which is enabling that transaction to happen for that particular printing industry has been managed by a standard called as PADSS, which is Payment Application Data Security Standard, which is recently going to be replaced by PCS SSL. Now, given all of those pieces into picture, you just imagine the post of control as an organization, as a fintech organization that I need to manage. Now, with the evolution of these multi-rails, the digital transactions which are happening, there are additional now set of uh, medium which is like CPOC or SPOC, okay? which is enabling you to do transaction using your mobile phones. This is also having a lot of set of requirements which as an organization, as an entity that you need to comply. So you have to be very thoughtful to understand that where your data is coming from, where it is going, what kind of regulations are going to be impacted because of the entire scenario. And based on that, you have to actually understand how your cyber security posture is going to evolve for your organization. That, that's something that, that I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I just, uh, just have a very small submission. Uh, the law always ca plays catch up. Remember that. I'm talking as a lawyer, right? Innovation has to lead. Okay? Uh, Especially when there is a, a frontier of technology that you want to build on, like if you ask me what is the law on AI, there is no law on AI, right? Now, I was uh, in Dubai recently and I was sitting with a billionaire and he had an app on his phone, he took a picture of me and he, he converted that into me singing a song. Now, I was impressed by that. I wasn't like, oh, my face is now on a video singing a song. So I would say that as people who are young and, you know, uh, the next generation after Gen Z is called the Gen Alpha, which is people born after 2010. Now imagine that you need to build a world for people who are digital native, crypto native, okay? So you have to think futuristically. Don't think about, I, I'm not just saying that cyber security is not important. I'm just saying that there are firms that are working on that already. What do you want to do, right? What can you feel empowered to do, right? What, what makes you try? I mean, those are the questions that I was hoping you would answer, ask. And, you know, uh, I'm not sure where uh, uh, you're from, but I think, is it Netherlands? Uh, are you Dutch? I don't know, because uh, uh, I was going with your accent. But uh, what I would say, in, in, in Europe, I've seen that, I, yeah, I thought so, yeah. In Europe, the, the, the main way that people study, especially if you look at Finland, if you look at, like, uh, Denmark, they encourage you to ask questions, right? So be inquisitive is number one. Look for what you can thrive in and create innovative structures. Uh, you know, UPI, which you talked about, is the biggest innovation from India. And this is a fintech innovation which has not been done globally anywhere. So if we can track that for 1.4 billion, I'm sure we can track other things. That's all I say. Thank you so much. We'll quickly take a few questions from the audience here. We can actually do. Yes, sir. Spoke about the retention rates going down, digitalization, and uh, like you said, 10 minutes of uh, retention capability through digitalization. So, I would like to ask the gentleman from Metaverse what is going to happen next when he moves on the Metaverse platform or do it.
that's a, that's a great question actually. And uh, I have friends who are actually building uh, educational metaverses. Uh, in fact, the ex-CEO of Twitter, Manish Maheshwari, uh, along with Tanya Pratap, had set up a company called Invact. Unfortunately, they had a split, so Mahesh, Manish had left. Uh, he was on a sabbatical, but Tanya is still building that. So the idea there also was, how can we get students in an immersive experience? Because, uh, especially with the pandemic, all, it, the only innovation schools did, globally, not just in India, was Zoom. But the thing is, on Zoom, you can't interact with each other while you're learning. Right? That, that sense of uh, camaraderie, that community, that, that sort of thing. Uh, now that is possible on the metaverse, because uh, currently, with uh, the technology that is there, typically you can access up to 50 uh, people at one time. So if you're uh, on a platform, and say uh, someone is uh, explaining something, you can see 50 people uh, with you. That's, that's as far as Decentraland Sandbox have gone. But the uh, latest announcement and the latest launch that happened with Yuga Labs, which are the guys behind the other side, uh, they launched a, a beta with 4,000 people uh, where uh, you don't have... 4,000 people were having simultaneous conversations, uh, but in your line of vision, there was a limit. So it's very much like the real world. So if I was to be in this room and all of you are talking, right? At any one time, I can't hear what the gentleman at the back is talking, but I can hear what, what's going on here. And I think that gamification, and I, let me explain something. Gamification leads to more attention. And the best gamers in the world are actually more disciplined. The same thing with chess. Now, we think chess is superior to an online game because chess is about the mind. But that's what most online games are about. Now, what people are trying to now achieve is saying, how can we reward gaming, right? And look, we're, we're reaching a level where at least 30 countries right now are stating at inflation rates of more than 15%, which means money is going to soon become redundant. And actually, I envisage a world where the, the government will give you free money to play games, because that's why everyone is pushing the agenda, whether it's Epic Games, whether it's Apple, whether it's Sony, whether it's Samsung, whether it's Microsoft now. So I think uh, it's just a matter of time. So I would suggest, you know, letting uh, Indian uh, youngsters become the best gamers in the world. Uh, I think that's a great way to create an alternative uh, career. And I think it's also a great way to impart training on the software which powers the game. Uh, and Mark, Mahesh, would you like to comment on this? Uh, any of you? Yeah, uh, so uh, agree with uh, what uh, the distinguished speaker mentioned about it. So, uh, like everything is going to be um, personalized, right? So, uh, how can you give a real like experience in the second world? That is that's that's still so you can be a different person in the real world, but you may like to be somebody else and learn it in a different way. So maybe games is one of that. Uh, we have seen gamification being applied on multiple domains, like to encourage crowdsourcing of information. It seems like one way of retaining attention. Any any more questions from the audience? Anybody want to want to ask? Yeah, go ahead, please. So, if you look at it, uh, hackathons are a challenge. So, it's a kind of a game. And uh, many of these are uh, hackathons actually get a lot of the game. Hackathons is one clear way of retaining attention. Okay, as we finish, do you guys have any passing thoughts? What motivates you? What is it that you guys are looking ahead? Uh, any thoughts about your future? Aditya, would you want to have a go? On? Yeah. So, speaking of the future, you know, we see, uh, I mean, as uh, someone here mentioned as well, since um, there won't be a single career for the future generation. That's what uh, everyone understands. And uh, I kind of agree with that as well. And uh, I think uh, institutions, uh, people as well, and families of the same reasons, they are uh, more stereotyped, uh, but they are changing. And with that, we we'll definitely see more careers opening up, uh, as gaming is one uh, which uh, you mentioned. 
Um, and uh, I think uh, diverging to a lot of things at the same time is uh, not just, uh, it, it won't just uh, be uh, a hobby. It can be a career as it is. And uh, it is also good for our mental health since we won't be distracted by things which could harm us. Maybe getting distracted is not such a bad thing. One thing is for sure, we certainly don't know what's going to be there out there. The future is not out there. The future is, as somebody pointed out, the future is happening right now. Uh, I believe it was Albert Einstein who said, I never think of the future. It comes soon enough. Um, with that line, I would like to thank all of you. Thank you so much for being here on the dais today, the students mostly. Um, thank you so much for your time. Sincerely appreciate it. And all my distinguished colleagues, uh, colleagues over here, thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much. Ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause for this wonderful discussion that we just had, which included uh, uh, our esteemed uh, speakers and our student uh, panelists as well. May I now request uh, Ms. Marketa